Welcome to the Managing Partners Forum North America. I'm Larry Stroud. The forum's latest webinar today is entitled Dealing with the Underperforming or Misbehaving Partner. We have over 80 participants uh, throughout North America and also uh, from across the world. We are going to have questions today uh, that we are going to put out to our participants. Uh, there will be five in total uh, that you will be asked to address online. We will do each question separately and then immediately provide the results. We will kick off with three questions and then the final two questions will be later in the session. We have an excellent panel today uh, that will deal with the topic from different angles. Joining the panel are Christian Fitzpatrick. Christian is the Managing Principal of Chicago Accounting for Miller, Cooper & Co ranked in the top 10 in the Chicago area and in the top 100 accounting firms in the US. She has served on the executive committee of the firm since 2011. As managing principal, her guides, she guides the growth and direction of the firm. Sandro Nikia, Sandro is an industrial and organizational psycho psychologist and founder of SI Consulting based in Ontario, Canada. He has worked with the leadership of a number of big four accounting firms and consulting firms, amongst other sectors. SI Consulting is a firm specializing in leadership assessment and development and team effectiveness. Angela Sebastian. Angela is the Chief Executive Officer of Chicago law firm Levenfeld Perlstein LC, a mid-sized law firm recognized as an innovative leader in the legal industry. As CEO, she is responsible and accountable for the firm's commitment to clients and its overall performance. Angela has designed and implemented the firm's client experience strategy called the LP Way, and she has orchestrated the firm's governance and succession plans. Nick Jarrett Kerr is from NJ Consulting. Nick was a practicing lawyer and for many years has been an advisor to law firms on issues of strategy, governance, and leadership. He is also a member of Edge International, a global consultancy to law firms. He is an author of many publications, including the best-selling special report, Tackling Partner Underperformance in Law Firms, now in its second publication. Our moderator today is Patrick McKenna. Patrick is an author, lecturer, strategist, and seasoned advisor to leaders of premier law firms. He is the author of 11 books. His most recent work entitled Strategy Innovation, Getting to the Future First, was published by Legal Business World. I'm Larry Stroud, and I am acting as the host today. I am a coach to lawyers and accountants to help them to become better business developers. Prior to establishing my advisory firm, Corverge, which is spelled with a K, I held partner positions in two international accounting firms at various stages in my career. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Patrick. Uh, so Patrick, as our moderator, please take over. Uh, let me start by going around our panel, uh, getting some opening remarks from each of them, uh, especially about their roles. Uh, the firms, the cultures that they're working in. I call her Angie, so I'll start with Angie. Uh, what was no, not noted is Angie is one of the few non-lawyer CEOs within a law firm. Uh, and I know that hers is a no-nonsense kind of firm that actually has a no-asshole rule. Angie, do you want to tell us a little bit about your firm and how you reign over it? Oh, reign, that's a... That's a <laughs> So I thank you, Patrick, um, and welcome everyone. I have been at Levenfeld Perlstein for 22 years. We've just celebrated our 22nd year. So by law firm standards, we're still in our infancy stage, I think, uh, comparatively. Um, but when we started Levenfeld Perlstein over 20 years ago, we started with the concept of what we didn't want to build, which was the status quo law firm um, that is really having so much difficulty now with the topic 
um, that we're discussing today of underperforming partners, um, as well as with some of the other um, challenges that law firms are facing. So we are viewed as a very progressive firm, um, starting with the executive team and how our law firm is run and organized. We do have an executive committee, um, but they tend to be very um, external, uh, externally focused, strategic based only. They don't make uh, management decisions. Um, my team does that and the executive team does that. And we have professionals at the executive level um, for every discipline, for technology, for business development, for marketing, for talent, for professional development. Um, so that's a little bit about how we're organized. Um, when I was invited to speak, I, I, I shared this on my social media accounts. I see the issue of underperforming partners being more an issue of um, ineffective management structure and undeveloped leaders. I don't think that the problem is the partners. I think the problem is that the leaders are not transparent and clear with what is expected. Um, and so we, we strive to do that at LP, very focused on transparency, clarity, alignment. Um, you know, I could talk for a long time about how we actually execute on all of those. Um, but we are kind of infamous for our no asshole rule. There is a citizenship standard and expectation of everyone in the firm. We do have measures to make sure that that standard is met. We actually have a survey. It's how we kind of back up that um, standard. We put it in our offer letters. It's expected right from the beginning that everyone will um, adhere to the expectation of being a good citizen, of not being the big gorilla in the room. And we have parted ways with people who violated that rule, which really, you know, now 20 years late into it, it gives it a lot of teeth. Um, so, you know, I want to just be respectful of everyone else's time here, but that's a little bit of an overview about me and Levenfeld Pearlstein. Thank you, Angie. I may even come back to that letting letting people leave. Kristen, you're you're our other firm leader. You you come from a firm with a strong culture, and you said uh, you let the culture drive how we approach things. Tell us more. Sure. Um, well, thank you for including me. I appreciate it, um, and and welcome everyone. You know, like Angie, um, and we've gotten to know each other through um, you know working at our firms in the Chicago area and working with many common clients over the years, and we found that we have very similar cultures. Um, you know, our culture is also very corporate based. We're we're not a partnership. Um, you know, we are managed by the executive leadership team, which you know I oversee. We do have an executive committee, but as Angie mentioned, you know they're more external focused um, and market focused. And you know we let the professionals um, do their thing in managing the firm and managing our business, which I think makes a big difference um, in how the culture you know comes to be. Um, where not every partner is involved in every decision. And certainly as we grew over the years, that was a little bit of a struggle um, from when we were a smaller firm. But today, that's that's who we are. Um, we're a very high performance, uh, fast moving, fast paced growth culture. The firm has grown tremendously. I've been here for about 25 years, but the firm is 100 years old. Um, started by two people, and we have over 400 people today. So, you know, we we have grown so tremendously that we've demanded excellence um, from our people, and really, that's that's driven our culture. We do not allow coasting and complacency. You know, those are things we don't like losing, but you know, we aren't always just satisfied with winning either. We want to keep pushing, raising the bar and taking things to the next level. And we expect all of our partners, um, you know, to be on board with that, that initiative. Kristen, that's great. Thank you. Sandra, let me move to you next. I mean, as an industrial psychologist, I imagine you see firm leaders having to contend with all kinds of crap. Tell us a little bit about what brings you to the, the, the topic. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, yeah, I would probably, uh, I tend to work with some of the larger accounting and legal firms in, in my country. 
Um, and most of the work is it can probably be categorized into two specific areas. One is when the individual has been promoted, uh, he or she is taking on a new role. Uh, they're an office managing partner, and it's more of a transition coaching kind of a gig. Uh, the second is that, quite frankly, they're much more challenging. Well, you have a, usually it's senior partner. Uh, he or she is probably a market maker, incredibly technically skilled, but they're derailing uh, for various reasons, almost always uh, leadership driven or interpersonal. That category of folks is probably the toughest kind of consulting I do, coaching I do. Um, the work almost always involves some kind of an assessment. I want to understand what's going on with this individual. That almost always involves an uh, in-depth assessment of the individual, but also quality of 360s with his or her circle of influence. That feedback is always shared with the organization because part of the conversation we have is whether the individual is coachable or not. And there's that's not always a given. Uh, in many cases, and I'll be frank, it's old guys like us that are really difficult to coach. Uh, we just don't want to be coached. We don't like being coached. We're pretty successful. What the heck are you going to tell me? I've got X and of your stuff to go on. Uh, I find that cadre of folks also are very resistant to the feedback. Uh, I've had in situations where I've had to actually go back and categorize and do frequency counts of the number of people that said this, the number of people that said this, the number of people that said this. These are all mini CEOs. Uh, they feel they shouldn't be evaluated. You think I'm bad. You should talk to Fred or Mary and so on and so forth. Um, and I'll, I want to pick up on a theme here. Um, these are assholes. Uh, and what the firms will tell you, he or she may be an asshole, but they're our asshole. So consequently, we want to work with them in some way. Should. <laughs> good one. Good one. Thank you. I made a note of that. Is the individual coachable or not? We'll come back to that. Nick. Nick is an old friend. We've known each other for well over 20 years, and that's not a special report he's authored. That's a, that's a major 200-page book. Nick, tell us a little bit about what brought you to this whole topic. And, and Well, thank you, Patrick. It goes back to when I was a managing partner, really, um, which was a long time ago. I've been in consultancy now for 20 years about. Uh, when I was a managing partner, what I inherited was a partnership where the governance was ineffective. Uh, there were reserved, reserved positions uh, whereby you couldn't sack a partner unless you had a super majority and there was no definitions uh, anywhere in the firm of standards or criteria or what constituted underperformance or anything. And, um, and, and I found that really difficult as a managing partner. In fact, we had one partner who was dramatically underperforming but he was able to he, he'd made friends with a sufficient number of partners in the firm uh, to be able to sort of block any attempt to get rid of him and he hid behind them and and that was a real struggle to to get get him out and and, and that sort of colored my my view towards how to have a proper uh, uh, um, Angie you, you you talked about ineffective management structures and it's so great to to have a firm that you could start you know in that way but some firms aren't started that that way and 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 what I found as a, as a consultant is that I've uh, c come to firms where they have got a an outdated structure an outdated view an outdated culture even and and it's really tough for the for the leaders of the firm to get to grips with that Okay, you get ineffective leaders as well. But even where you've got a really um, effective leader, and I'm, I'm sure all those who are delegates here today um, are very effective in their jobs, sometimes they will have great difficulty in pushing through what they know ought to be done. And, and, and so it's been my kind of life's nice work to try and, and help firms address all that, um, in, particularly in the, in the context of underperformance. Nick, thank you. Great. Let's let's build on this with a couple of polls. Uh, we we set out a, a few questions for you as participants to give us some feedback on. Uh, the first question: What is your best estimate of the proportion of misbehaving partners at a typical firm? Can we put that poll up and and allow you to uh, give us your estimate on on this? And notice we said a typical firm, not not your firm, not your firm, just a typical firm. Interesting. Okay. Kind of in the 15% uh, range <clears throat> overall. Let's go to the second question. What would you consider to be a realistic target for the proportion of underperforming partners? Oh, well, lower, more in the uh, maybe 5 8% range. Our last question. Which of the following good practice statements are true for your firm? Select all that apply. And we've got a range of uh, about a dozen 
good practice statements. Now, this is for your firm. Nobody really measures the true cost of partner underperformance. Next lowest guess would be our firm has a formal process for which they monitor and support struggling partners and in the event of failure, manage them out. Less than one in four. We regularly consider de-equitizing or deploying partners. Less than one in four. What do you think, folks? Any comments on the results as you see them there? Well, what jumps out to me immediately is the last one, which is the 20% of the people who say none of this is applicable. Um, and it's so unfortunate, but it's I definitely think that's true. Um, it, there is really, I don't know if, if um, anyone else has been following what's happening at McKinsey, but um, and the ousted leader, and it really just strikes me how easily that could happen in many, maybe most law firms, it's really challenging to um, set expectations and adhere to them with a group of autonomous, independently focused people. Um, and it, it's very, very challenging from a leadership perspective. And, I, you know, it, it's not like a comp corporation where it's a, just a top down do what you're supposed to do and um, no questions are allowed or asked, um, we have to align interests. So we have to align the governance structure and the expectations with the personal interests of the people um, in it and that's, or they'll leave. <laughs> so, I mean, and then you, you, there's not a game to play when people leave. So um, that's what jumps out to me, Patrick. Is, okay. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Other observations? Anybody? Nick? Yeah, I'm interested in the one uh, that a third, a third uh, of the respondents say they have a comprehensive performance management system for partners that's responsive and flexible, provides a positive supporting role and avoids a blamed culture. And I think that's one that's really worth working on. Um, uh, one of the things, I, I mean, I remember going to a firm not so long ago who who, who said, um, oh, we're putting in this partner into performance management. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Oh, because he's underperforming. So, so there was this sort of vibe that, that, um, that, that, that a performance management system is only for those who have a less than um, average performance. Uh, whereas I, my view is that you, you should have a performance management system. It doesn't need to be bureaucratic. It doesn't, but it does need to be flexible. But it's for all partners. It, it sets the standards. It sets the, it 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 helps to reflect a positive culture and, and so on and so forth. And that's one area that that I would, I would advise firms of all sizes and to, to work on. Even if it's just a couple of sheets of paper, it doesn't need to be a huge book. It's just got to be setting some standards. And am I, am I correct, Nick? And it's not just the billable performance type standards. It's the behavioral standards. Absolutely. Echoing what Angie was saying earlier about, you know, the, 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 the no, no assholes rule or no jerks rule and, and, and adherence to values and, and, and behaviors and so on. Yep, definitely. Because I'm going to throw it out there. And I shared this with you before, the, before this webinar. But a colleague and I surveyed, interviewed 124 firm leaders uh, a few years back and found out that 89% of them uh, claimed they had problems with bullying and lack of respect. 79% uh, not being a team player with a me first personal agenda. I mean, the bullying behavior that goes on, I think either these numbers are not reflective of it at only 15% or, or people, you're not aware of it. Thoughts? Am I wrong? I'll chime in. I'll tell you, I get brought in for those specific kind of situations where uh, exactly what you just talked about, Patrick. Um, and I'll, I'll extend it a little bit, too. Uh, in some cases, you have, and Angie talked about this uh, when we were on uh, our previous call. In some cases, you have folks who have tremendous client relationships and they won't let other partners within that client relationship. So there's there, there's a lack of collaboration. There's a belief this this client has to work with me because they love me. So there's no sharing. 
Um, and, and, it, and in some cases, there's blocking and tackling. They will not allow other people uh, to work in that firm. So Angie talked about this. It's like the client belongs to the individual as opposed to the client truly belonging to the firm. Kristen, your observations, you're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> All sounds familiar. Um, you know, what, what struck me is <clears throat> just, I, I think there is a tendency to, to think about these things when there's a problem. Right. And rather than be reactive to the problem, what we've tried to do is is build a culture where, you know, we want everyone to take it to the next level. We want to raise the bar for every single partner. Um, and and so while we want, you know, behavior standards and citizenship standards and and those types of things, there's a minimum expectation for those. But what we really try to focus on is how do we get people to take it to the next level? Um, regardless of where they are. And so, of course, we have to deal with when there is a significant problem. But a lot of our focus is on the other end, where we're not just reacting to the problem, but we're trying to be proactive um, so that it benefits everyone and benefits the firm and, and, you know, benefits our growth culture. Now, can you give us a little bit of an example of the proactive, something that you've, you've perhaps done, introduced, initiated? Yeah, we we've done a lot of, you know, different things over the years and I think we we recognized a few years ago that um we always focused on what you should do better. Yeah. Um and so the things that you did well and that you were naturally good at and you could really probably take to that next level didn't really get talked about. You know, it was just sort of assumed. And so we modified our evaluation process to not only include the things that you're working on in your goal setting, but also to include goals that are strengths for you. What are you, you know, what are you focusing on that you're already very good at? And what is your goal to taking that up to the next level so that we could have conversations and highlight those things, sort of reinforce the positive behavior and not always just be talking about, well, you do these six things well, but you know, this one you've really gotta, you've really got to focus on. And what we found is that the energy around that is really positive. People like to do things they're good at. They like to be challenged when they're good at something. And so we could probably have a whole other conversation about this. Um, and I know that's not necessarily the focus of today, but you know, we've found that to be a real positive. Well, let's just spend another second on that. I mean, you touch on something that is intriguing in that I think sometimes we think of underperformance only in the billable context, billable hours, you underperform it. What about the individuals we have in our firm who, for the most part, are on autopilot, doing the same shtick day in, day out, uh, and whether they're marginally profitable or not, like, what is that doing for the firm? And how do you how do you address those? Yeah, and, and I think because of our high growth, um, you know, that's something that just isn't accepted here um, because we're we're running fast and and the firm, you know, has been very fortunate to grow. So we need our leaders to to grow at that same pace, right? And it becomes very obvious when someone's doing the same thing they did last year, or you know, all of their metrics are you know, sort of even even with what they've previously done. And we have direct conversations about how do you, how are you going to take it to the next level? Um, and, and we do have them set out their goals for specifically that. Um, and then if they don't meet those, you know, we talk about them and we figure out, okay, was the goal unrealistic or did we not do the right things to meet the goal and how do we modify going forward? Angie, you were going to add something? Yeah, and and Kristen uh, covered it um, a, a piece of what I was going to say. Um, like she said, we're very similar in how our firms operate. Um, but if someone's coasting, Patrick, they're probably incentivized to do that. You really do need to take a look at the metrics. And we've done a lot of work with what we measure and how it's published. So transparency is a huge uh, performance management tool um, at LP. We use a lot of peer pressure, a lot of dashboards um, for everyone to see. And so, and, and it's not just measuring the, the hard economic um, stats, but it is measuring some of these softer investments 
that are required to keep the firm going and to serve our clients. So a lot of our metrics are, are around clients. Um, and so there, we're, we're kind of making this distinction where we started talking about the, the misbehaving partner, the asshole partner. And then what Kristen was talking about was the underperforming one or how to get someone to perform at their peak performance. There are, these are two very, I think, different oh, yeah. and, and should be addressed differently. But um, people on the call may not know that my, I came up through finance and accounting. So where I kind of started this journey, and I have always considered LP to be my big management experiment. Um, and where we started this, where I started this journey was um, when clients weren't paying and really there was a problem. And so bring in the CFO and try to figure out what happened. Well, what happened happened probably a year ago, not now. Um, and so trying to deconstruct what happened and be proactive about managing the, the experience and the impact to clients. Um, and you, you really have to break down the, um, or we found that we've had to break down that tightly held relationship between the client and the attorney. You have to penetrate that. You have to get in there. And we started the entry to that when there was a problem because then we, it's out of the partner's hands. It's like, okay, this client's not paying now. So now you have to move over and we're going to figure out what's going on. And we did that, you know, initially um, to discover that this relationship is not what you think it is. Um, and there's a real cost here to the firm. Um, so a lot of our measures do, do go back to what is the economic cost um, that we're not even measuring. And there is a real cost to carrying bullies, even if they control a certain element of business, a certain proportion of business, you, there's a real cost to people not working with that person effectively. And you don't even know what that is in most cases until it's damaging. Um, so I maintain that the cost of carrying those people is far greater than separating with those people. Um, and it's not just my personal opinion. There is actually a book called The No Asshole Rule, and our, which, is, which is what our rule is based on and our expectation is based on. Um, and so I would encourage um, people who are experiencing, experiencing this problem to read that. And the final thing I'd, I'd like to say on this, um, Patrick, is the the there's just an economic measure that drives all of this. Why are we holding on to these people? Why are we not letting these people go? And if you put all of your eggs in one basket, then that's what's going to happen. The person who holds that basket holds all of the power and it's impossible to get all of these other changes done. So I think it's very important that firms make sure they have a diversified revenue source um, and that it's integrated and it's not connected to a specific person. Um, it has to be integrated and you have to insist that other people be brought in. It's in the firm's best interest. And most importantly, it's in the client's best interest. And so we have all of these conversations internally about what do we do about this partner? What do we do about that partner? We have to make sure that our clients are part of that conversation. How does this affect our clients? How is this conversation that we're having right now impacting or undermining that relationship with the client? Um, and so, like I said, I could go forever, so I'll just cut myself off there. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. Let me go to Nick at Sandro. Uh, your thoughts on, uh, you know, how to deal with or seeing partners who are either coasting or the overall cost of the firm, and we're totally uh, un, un, just not observing it or tracking it or whatever. Nick, I think uh, on the uh, on the on the cost of it, there's, uh, and I'd like to link in with what Sandro was saying about about the client side of things and uh, Angie as well. Um, there was an intriguing set, uh, set of statistics that were first produced by Redwood Analytics some years ago. They're now part of Adirond, I think, which which analysed the um, what happened in law firms. It was a law firm survey to hours 
um, uh, did those hours go down or did they go up? Did they was there attrition or was there positives? And what that report showed was that where with the clients where there was only one partner, over time the hours recorded went down. And when there was clients with more than one partner, the hours tended to either stabilize or go up. Um, and that was quite stunning to me. And I think what I learned from that, and I introduced this to a number of firms, where what we did was we looked at comparative data for clients of a similar type across the firm. Clients where there was more than one partner involved of a, of a certain type and clients where there was one partner involved, what the spread of work was between practice areas for that client and so on and so forth. And almost always the positives were where there were more than one partner and more than one practice area involved. And, and therefore you can therefore deduce that even if you've got a coaster who's not necessarily prima facie an underperformer, they may be in the middle of the, the pack, but they're not doing the firm justice if they're holding up, they're putting their arms around the client. And that's an area where I think the data can start to throw up amber lights for you as to what's actually going on in terms of people's performance and behavior and, and enables the managing partner or the practice group leader to say, hang on, what's going on here with this client, with this partner? And to try to, you know, get someone like Sandra in to coach um, or, or to cope with it in some other way. Excellent point. Excellent point. So it's not just billable hours. We're also talking about partners who are coasting, partners who uh, aren't investing in, in uh, building their skills. And and uh, yeah, Sandro. Uh, I want to concur with everything uh, that my esteemed colleagues have already talked about. One, one more piece I want to add to that, the cost here, um, is these folks uh, also should be on the hook to grow their people. So part of the advantage they have is they're working with great clients. They should be actually metric. And I'm glad Angie and, and Kristen talked about this. There should be metrics in their profiles around developing, developing their skill sets, but the developing skill sets of others too. Now, this is one area where a lot of partners don't have these skills. This is one area where they do need a little bit of help, how to mentor, how to coach, how to uh, delegate effectively with the commensurate authority and responsibility and so on. But we should be holding our partners accountable as well for ensuring they're growing our future partners and to, for succession purposes and so on. So there should be no reason people are coasting. There's a lot of work to be done to help the entire firm be successful. Sandro, you touched on delegating. Let me let me add one more dimension to this performance issue. Um, over the years, I've had multiple opportunities where I've been at retreats, uh, facilitating the retreat. I got 100 partners in the room. I throw out the question. What percentage of your client work could you delegate to someone more junior, given that that junior were trained to do it with quality? Now, of course, take out the stuff where the client says, oh, only you can do it. You know, what percentage of your work could you delegate? Anybody care to guess the, the typical number I get from large firms of at least 100 attorneys, 100 lawyers or larger? Voting, voting anonymously with 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 little devices. What what percentage do you think we get, Chris? Ten percent. How much? Ten. Ten percent. I could delegate ten percent. Way up. How much? Take a guess. Kind of not fair because I've already answered this question in a prior program, but I think it's somewhere around forty something percent. It's pretty high. Too low. Too low. Yeah. These are these are these are partners in name brand firms voting anonymously. 70%. 70. Where they're saying we could delegate that. Why don't you? Well, there's a performance issue that that needs to be addressed, I think, in many firms. Why don't you? Yeah, I, I definitely missed the anonymous part of that. I was thinking yeah. that they were um, you know, they were being named. But, um, you know, that's something we've been really focused on. I just want to touch on that for a minute, if I can. Um, as a hundred year old firm, we have, I mean, succession, you know, we've had to, to do that a number of times. And we want to make sure that, you know, when a partner retires or leaves the firm, that that client stays, that we're integrated into the next generation. Um, and and I think there's a, a lot of things that have to happen to do that. But delegating, having multiple partners on the engagement, having a strong team, and then compensating your partners for that. 
Um, you know, when we look at lateral hires at, at very experienced levels, senior managers and, and partners, a lot of times firms, you know, they say they want that, but the compensation structure says something different. And we will, you know, run into those discussions often. And I think that's just a really important component, um, you know, to the whole succession thing. Because if you say one thing and compensate for something else, I've found that you can talk till you're blue in the face, but where they get compensated is where they're going to put their time. Right on. Sandro, did you have a comment you wanted to add? You yeah, to actually, add? this is, a, this, this, I'm smiling because this is actually one of my standard practices when I'm training people to delegate more effectively and so on. Uh, at one coaching session, I'll say, next time I see you, I want you to identify 20% of the things on your plate that you're going to take off your plate. So next time I see you, I want you to be able to tell me what you've taken off your plate and you've actually delegated. The next time I show up, about half the time they haven't done it. So what I do is say, okay, now I want you to turn over to your people and ask them what they can pull off your plate. They can pull off a heck of a lot more than 20%. So if people are really resistant to make it happen. Yeah. Angie. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to be careful here. The partners are not the enemy, right? We're, I don't want to ostracize the partners. All of our firms need our partners. We need our partners to be engaged. Um, they don't know how to do a lot of these things. And so when I opened, I said, I think misbehaving or um, underperforming partners is more about ineffective management structures. What kind of support are we getting? And I learned this pretty early on coming up to finance. It was, you know, be more profitable. And everyone said, okay, yeah, we'll be more profitable. No one had any clue what that actually means. It means stop doing this or start doing that or keep doing this. Um, and so be innovative. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, and even when it comes to something that you think is common knowledge, you need to delegate more. It's not that simple. So it's complicated. So what kind of support are we giving the partners? What kind of uh, range uh, are we giving them? Because it's going to cost more in the short term to transition a relationship, bring someone in. There's going to be some overlap. There's going to be some inefficiency. It's more of a longer term um, endeavor. And, and so how do we support them, not only through comp, but through their own insecurity of, well, if I let that go, what am I going to do? I mean, these are actual questions um, that we've had to support partners through. And it's scary. Um, and so it's, to me, I think this is less of a problem of bullying and more of a problem of insecurity and the firm saying one thing without giving support or guidance and not changing the measurements to um, help make sure that that happens. Great point. Sandro, you had your hand up? Uh, yeah, I want to pick up actually a great point you brought up, Angie, because partners will ask that. But here's a really simple concept. You should be working at the top of your licensure. You should be working at what you're really good at. Anything that you really is beneath, not hate to say it that way, beneath you, but stuff that other people can easily do at a much lower price point, they should be doing it. I'll give you a simple example. This came out of the surgery field. You, you had, in Latin, about 15, 20 years ago, we had nurses actually closing surgical wounds because it wasn't worth having the, the orthopedic surgeon or the neurosurgeon doing that. Nurses can do it equally well. So work at the top of your licensure is a good rule of thumb to have. We call that highest and best use. Helping yep. people uh, understand and communicate and align on highest and best use. Nick. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that, that, that they've said. And, and, and I've seen that. Patrick, you're going to pick up. There's been a question in the chat thing. Are you going to pick up on that? Or would you like no, to? No, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm so concentrating on this. I didn't pick it up. Go ahead. Uh, well, I think it fits in, really. Somebody said I'd be interested in the panelist view on how important it is that individual incentive structures are linked to these behavioral elements we were talking about a while ago, as opposed to financial contributions. Does this cause a challenge in retaining some partners with high client impact? Um, and it's a great question. And um, it sort of ties in a bit because uh, you, you get you, 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 you get the behavior that you value. Um, and if everything is based upon the dollar or the, the pound sterling or the euro, depending on where, where our, our audience is coming from, if everything depends on that, then you are going to get some peculiar behaviors, but not necessarily underperforming behaviors, but behaviors that don't really fit what you want, don't fit your values. 
And, and I'm a great advocate of the balanced scorecard approach, whereby you set a set of uh, criteria across a broad uh, spectrum of, of things, including you know, people management, uh, people development, teamwork, and so on and so forth, um, and firm uh, leadership. And, and you have to find ways, it's not, sometimes not easy, but find ways of assessing or measuring that. And you, you, if you're talking about compensation, you do comp- compensate partly on that basis. Um, and, and so you, you're, you are saying to a client, clients, partners with high client impacts, that's not all you should be doing. That's not all we value around here. And look, this is how, we, how we're going to do it. Good points, Nick. Thank you. Like I, I would like to go to the two last questions of our poll and then come back to examine and explore, you know, how do you have some of these difficult conversations with maybe partners who haven't been behaving or not performing, whatever. So let's go to the last two questions in our poll. Uh, question number four, which are the three most common causes of partner underperformance at your firm? Lack of awareness on how to resolve their underperformance. Okay. That's number one. Number two, poor time project management. The last polling question for today, what are the three most popular options for dealing with underperforming partners at your firm? Uh, Partner development and training. Number one. And number two, reinvigorating moderate performers. Everybody's had an opportunity to take a look at that. Notice expulsion is right at the bottom. So it's certainly not something we want to do unless we're really forced. De-equitization is, is also fairly low. Well, comments. Let's, let's talk about the partner uh, most common causes for just a moment. What, what, are, what are your thoughts, your observations, anyone? Is that consistent with what you see, Angie? I feel like I always go first. Um, not just here, but... <laughs> everywhere. So um, look, the good news is that the poll um, shows, and this is my experience as well at Levenfeld Perlstein and in the legal industry, a lot of these issues are coachable. They are addressable. They, they are not, um, they're not the end of it all. There doesn't have to be a black or white approach. Um, And I, um, I actually am trained and am a certified coach by the ICF and the reason I, International Coaching Federation, the the reason I went to coaching and to learn more about coaching is because I realized that, you know, all these brilliant management strategies and structures, you know, all of these um, advisors, uh, not just in the legal industry, but in business, you know, Patrick Lencioni, Jim Collins, Peter Drucker, you know, all of them, Ken Blanchard. Um, nope, this doesn't, wasn't working. It wasn't all of these great things were not, not working in my law firm. And so I realized that people just weren't embracing it, even though intellectually it makes sense. It's smart in good businesses do this. And there's proof. You know, lawyers love proof. Where's the proof? There's lots of proof. These are renowned, world-renowned business studies, but it wasn't occurring at the personal level. And so it kind of led me to just be more curious about coaching. Um, And so I love, Sandro, that you, you spend a lot of your time coaching, and we've brought in a lot of coaches at LP, um, just because it is such a big change and transformation that is required. And even though you wouldn't think it, um, it's where the necessary work lies in my experience. So that's what I show that these issues are addressable and they're coachable. Sounds good. Let's, let's everybody just go to the one lack of awareness on how to resolve their underperformance. If you're coaching and and assisting the, the non-performing partner, whatever, what does this mean? What, What do you need to do? Anybody? Ideas, suggestions, Kristen? Well, you know, I I think we've probably all been to meetings where we present something and we're talking about something and there's a lot of heads nodding. Everyone seems to be in agreement. We leave the meeting, nothing changes. (laughs) And 
you know, I, well, that's frustrating as a leader, right? Um, you know, as you drill down to that, I think Angie hit it on the head before. A lot of it isn't they don't want to do it. It's just they don't know how to do it or they don't really understand like what changes, you know, could be made to maybe make that incremental progress. Um, And they're afraid to ask. You know, they don't want to be the person who comes into your office and says, I don't really know how to do this. You know, these are high performing um, you know, people who know what they're doing and they're perceived as experts, you know, in the accounting industry and within our firm and to, you know, have the confidence and and be able to to come and have that conversation takes a lot. And so we've tried to to break that down, you know, one, just not making assumptions about what they might know how to do, but, you know, have those individual conversations and really you know, hone in on how do you do it? What, you know, what does it mean? I know what I mean when I say it, but somewhere between that and, you know, their ears and something gets lost in translation. And we we try to, you know, have that breakdown. And I think the coaching is critical, right? Because if you're just giving orders and, and you know, approaching it from a, you know, I said to do this, so I expect you to, you know, change tomorrow, you're never going to get where you want to be. Okay, throw it out to all of you. Give me some guidance. You, you've got, <laughs> specifically, you've got a partner who is underperforming uh, for whatever reason. They're just like they've gone into semi-retirement and not declared it. And your task is to go and coach them. Um, obviously, have a difficult conversation. Uh, are there any things that you would recommend from your experience you need to do prior to having that conversation, in the midst of having that conversation? Do you do that conversation electronically uh, via telephone or video conference? Or you, or do, you, uh, do you confer with them uh, via written emails? Like, like, how should you, how should you not do that sort of coaching for our, for our listeners? What, what, what's your guidance? What have you discovered? Well, I can share, but I saw that there were other hands raised, so I just want to make sure I'm not monopolizing. Go, go for it. Um, it's tricky. It depends. Like All of the words that no one likes. Um, it depends on the circumstance. It depends on the person. It depends on the relationship. But I think it starts with a direct conversation. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what the impact is. What's going on? And it's just a process of of inquiry first rather than accusation. And it's a conversation. And we've actually given, we we have spent, um, to Kristen's point, like people don't already know how to do this. We have developed a comprehensive, easy to understand guide on how to have challenging conversations with each other at LP. Um, And we've given specific scenarios like, you know, in this situation, here's some scripts. Um, here's how to have a difficult conversation. People don't necessarily know how to do it. So I think it starts with a conversation, Patrick, and there has to be trust, not an accusation, um, and based on inquiry. And I think the fewer people involved in that initial conversation, the better. You don't want the executive committee showing up at the front door saying, we've got to talk. Um, That's just not going to work at all. Do you suggest that they role play or practice before they actually do it? Sometimes, yeah, we've done that. Um, And often people will come to me to complain about somebody else. And and the first question I ask is, well, have you had this conversation with that person? Well, no. Well, then how do they know? And there's always two sides to every story, always um, or more. Um, And so how's it going to look if I come in now as the CEO and say, you know, partner X just came in to complain about you. What do you think the first thing that person is says to me is, well, why didn't he say anything to me? Why are you here telling me this? So it's really just teaching people how to have these difficult conversations with each other and creating the expectation that that is their job. It's your job to talk to your partner. It's your job to have this conversation with the associate. It's not my job as management. 
but this is your responsibility as a partner. And let me show you how to do it. We can talk through it. And, and a lot of times I'll do the role playing with the person and then they do the best they can. And usually we have to <laughs> dress the fallout later, but. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you, Angie. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, I, there, there, I do have a slight word of caution, um, uh, which which actually ties in with what Angie was saying. But it, it sort of go back a stage in the in the history of this, because what I've seen happen so often is that you get a partner who who has a bad run. Maybe he loses a client. Maybe he um, his billing performance goes down for a bit. And 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 then what te- what can happen? is that the practice group leader or somebody who's managing that person starts to micromanage him. And then that partner loses confidence in himself or herself and starts doubting himself and and, and sort of starts responding somewhat mechanically to to what you're telling him. And and then, you know, the whole thing spirals down from there. So so there is an earlier stage to me of, of management, which is be very careful how you manage someone or how you deal with someone who suddenly had a bad turn. Something's happened, you know, client loss or something, because that can often, if you don't, you, you, you can, there's a wonderful Harvard Business Review article called the Setup to Fail Syndrome. And, you know, I'd advise all people who, who manage others to have a read of that. It's, I think it's available quite quite freely um, because it is, you have to be very careful at a very early stage to spot some warning signs and get in there before people start, start doubting themselves. Great point. Any other observations, cautions? I know Larry's going to tell us pretty soon we're at the one minute mark or whatever. We and we haven't even gone into just, how to deal with the uncoachable <laughs> and and all of the other topics that we had on our plates. Larry, I just you? wanted to I just wanted to before I get into the close, I just wanted to say something about coaching. Uh, I've done coaching for years and I've been in house as a partner. But one of the most important things about coaching, and uh, I'm sure that Angela and and Kristen will say is that um, a lot of these people are frightened. (laughs) They don't know what's happening. And therefore, it's very, very sensitive for them to talk to you about these things, where they're going, what their future is. And it has to be handled very carefully. Um, And that's basically all I want to say. Um, So no matter who's doing the coaching, um, be careful. This person is very sensitive. And in some cases, they may be feel that they're they're being abused, and that's a whole other topic uh, by the uh, the person above them. Um, so, just le- I want to leave that there. So, back to you, Patrick, and then I'll close up after that. Okay. Okay. Just to add one further thought. I, I'm personally surprised that the personal problems uh, was so low in terms of uh, three most common causes. That's the one yeah. that I always hear is number one: personal problems. You know, they, they're substance abuse, uh, they're, they're burned out, uh, got matrimonial discord, whatever it may be. And it's the one that we don't dive a little bit deeper into. It's not what is going on, it's why is it happening. And, and so I think sometimes we overlook the personal problems issue, which is also a coachable issue, uh, but we, we forget about it. Yeah. I, you know, we could. I, I just want to get into so much more, and there's no time to do that. So all I can do is thank all of you for participating, and and some uh, very great in-depth insights into how to approach this. And I think we're all kind of in agreement from a firm level perspective that you get the behavior you tolerate. And so these are issues that you really need to take the bull by the horns as a firm leader and say, hey. We need to talk. We need to dive into this. Angie, I love what what you've talked about in terms of having an actual guidebook for people in terms of how to have difficult conversations. I think it's something we ignore. Larry, over to you. And so, thank you all so, for, for being part thank of Thank you. Yep. So thank you again. That's a great session uh, dealing with the underperforming and misbehaving partner. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out that I mentioned at the beginning of the session was uh, that we had about 70 participants today. 
For us, that's a really good number because we only invite managing partners, CEOs, and COOs. We screen out any requests to attend uh, any, any situation where it's not at that level. Uh, we do not have hundreds of participants. That's the way managing partners forum has grown. So again, thanks to the panel, Angela, Kristen, Sandra, and Nick, and thanks to our moderator, Patrick. Uh, we will be posting a video of today's webinar in about 10 days' time on the Managing Partners Forum website, which is mpfglobal.com. That's mpfglobal.com. And also, you will find it on the YouTube channel. Um, I just want to mention again quickly, uh, and Patrick corrected me, it's not a report, it's a 200-page book from Nick, and also a few chapters written by Patrick himself, and it's a book called Tackling Partner Underperformance in Law Firms, and it's available through ARC, which is spelled A-R-C, publications.co.uk. The next Managing Partners North America webinar will be in April, which will be focused on, focused on leadership succession. Uh, we have a great panel lined up, and you will receive an email soon. We'll be posting again, as I said, look for it, the video of today on MPF Global, and please pass on that link to anybody you would like. Thank you all, and have a great balance to your day. And stay safe. Please stay safe. Stay safe, of course. <laughs>